I've noticed that many influencers, especially diet influencers, only look into things closely enough to confirm their own biases. No one likes to waste time and effort, and they already think they know all the answers, so I guess that makes sense in a way. And this is also very true in the fitness world, which is one reason that mainstream fitness is so dead set against both a low-carb diet and fasting. It simply flies in the face of their entrenched beliefs. I don't subscribe to these views, but it's very important to look at criticism and possible weaknesses in your beliefs and practices, because otherwise you are operating in a state of delusion, which seems to be how the world is run today in general. That's why I'm going to take an in-depth look at what causes refeeding syndrome when you fast, and how to avoid it and also to talk about binging, as well as how to avoid that when fasting. I've also noticed that oftentimes people make up all kinds of reasons not to do things, simply because they think it's going to be hard or painful. Hell, yeah mate. Yeah, there might have been a bit of a mistake. <laughs> That's what they all say. Oh, there's been a mistake. It's not my time. I'm not ready to die. Just chill out, squire. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the view. When you fast, it can cause issues with electrolytes. In fact, it's largely insulin that causes you to hold on to electrolytes in the first place. The higher your insulin is, the more electrolytes you hold on to. This also drives water retention, and a lot of overweight people might be surprised at just how much of their extra weight is water. When you reduce it down to the simplest terms, inflammation is also just cells holding on to extra water. This causes many issues for the immune system because while you're supposed to have localized inflammation in areas of damage, in order to help stop bleeding, for example, it can also block immune bodies from reaching the area to take care of the damage. This also increases blood pressure by increasing the fluid volume within your blood vessels and because of the constriction of the blood vessels due to inflammation. This is why doctors promote a low sodium diet but insulin has a much stronger effect in this regard. Now, if you have insulin resistance, we said before, that means that insulin's not working properly. So then your body will increase the level of insulin. Now, the thing about insulin not working properly is it's very tissue specific. So while it might not work as, as it normally does in your muscle tissue, helping your muscles to take sugar out of circulation, it can still work relatively well at the fat level. So it help your fat stores take sugar out and it can still work quite well at the kidney level and one of the jobs of uh, insulin at the kidney level is to actually hold on to sodium so that's actually a, a much more important factor for increasing the sodium in your body and causing high blood pressure than is the amount of sodium that you consume if you consume a, a modicum of sodium but have very high insulin levels your body's going to try very hard to hold on to all of that sodium you can uh, on the other hand, consume a whole lot of sodium, but have very good low insulin levels, and any excess sodium that can you consume will just come out in your urine. High insulin levels prevent that from happening effectively. So fructose causes high blood pressure predominantly through the mechanism of insulin resistance. Now, it can also interact with... Uh, nitric oxide levels via uric acid and some of your viewers may have seen lectures by Professor Tom, uh, Robert Lustig. Um, he did a famous lecture that's about 11 years old now and he's got uh, quite complicated diagrams in there that demonstrate how fructose metabolism in, leads to changes in uric acid levels which then lead to changes in nitric oxide and nitric oxide is actually something that relaxes blood vessels and actually helps lower blood pressure and if you interfere with that pathway then that's another potential mechanism to increase blood pressure but i believe the predominant one is the sodium retaining effects of insulin at the kidneys that's not to say that everyone should take tons of salt or that you need salt or electrolytes while fasting fasting just 24 hours will reduce insulin to about 40 percent of the starting value and one of the biggest benefits of fasting is that this will greatly reduce inflammation this includes not only your blood vessels, but also neuroinflammation, 
which is associated with all mental illness and dementia. While ketones no doubt help with mental clarity, most people experience with fasting. Reducing inflammation is probably another important factor in this regard. Don't underestimate the effects of reducing inflammation, and don't assume it's good to take electrolytes while fasting, even if it does make it a little easier. Getting the sodium out of your body by reducing insulin is the main thing that's going to reduce inflammation in the body. For very long fasts, it may be necessary to take electrolytes, and it's going to make things easier, but even then, I would not obsess over it. I'd also just stick to salt, or salt and potassium, or just take sea salt or redmond salt, which should have a bit of all of the electrolytes and basically the right amounts. You can have too much magnesium more easily than you think, and your body has about 25 grams of magnesium in it. So it's harder to be deficient than you think it is. And almost everyone has too much copper today and not enough zinc or iodine. So you really have to be careful about supplementing electrolytes. And the more you take them, the more it signals your body not to hold on to them. So when you monkey around while fasting, this can cause problems with getting the proper nutrient intake when you do break the fast. This may sound like a very bad feature of fasting, but if you fast regularly and you get your resting insulin down to good levels, this stops being an issue. I don't even notice 36 hour fast anymore. I don't feel any difference at all because my body is not shooting out all of its electrolytes due to fluctuating insulin levels anymore. When I did my first 48 hour fast, it was a much different story and I felt weak beyond belief and I thought I was going to die. After that, each fast got easier and easier, though it took years before 72 plus hour fasts were truly easy for me. I credit that to my liver finally getting into really good shape. All this talk about electrolytes may be confusing, but it's important to understand that insulin controls the intake and loss of all nutrients, including electrolytes. Insulin is not only the trigger to take in glucose as many would paint it, but it's the trigger to take in all of these nutrients, and that's vital to understand. It also allows in things that are not supposed to be there, and that's likely one reason that fasting helps a great deal in resisting the side effects of chemotherapy. When insulin is very low, the cell doesn't take in much of anything. Instead, it pushes things out that don't belong there into the outside area of the cell, or it consumes them via autophagy. This especially includes electrolytes, and this is where the issue with refeeding comes in. If you just spend a week or more flushing out your electrolytes because you had very high insulin, and then your insulin went very low, and your cells are extremely insulin sensitive, that means as soon as you eat, the electrolytes will flood inside of your cells. That also means the electrolytes in your bloodstream will rapidly drop. You will also have a hyperactive insulin response in that first meal, and this makes things even worse. For fasts of a week or more, this could be so severe that you actually keel over from a heart attack because you don't have enough electrolytes inside of your bloodstream. Vitamin B1 deficiency becomes prominent after about a week of fasting, and this makes matters worse. B1 deficiency can cause heartbeat irregularities, and when this combines with low electrolytes and a large insulin spike, it can quickly become lethal. B1 deficiency also occurs in those who consume a high carb diet if they don't supplement it because burning carbohydrate consumes a great deal of vitamin B1. This becomes even worse in highly processed foods such as bread. This is the reason foods like bread are typically required by law to include supplemental vitamin B1 but keep in mind that they only give you just enough to keep from keeling over. If you do fast of a week or more, it is prudent to supplement B vitamins daily in order to prevent this and other issues down the road. Angus Barbieri famously fasted for over a year and lost almost 400 pounds in the process. Every day he took B vitamins and he also took occasional cream in his coffee. I don't think that fast that long or actually necessary, but I did do a 72 to 96 hour fast every week for many months in a row. There was a break of a few months where I didn't fast much, 
But in total, I did well over a year of fasting like that. And I lost about 100 pounds in the process. Not as much as old Angus, but not bad. Since insulin and electrolytes are the key to how refeeding syndrome works, along with vitamin B1, you probably guessed what the solution is. If you avoid carbs for the day you break the fast, your insulin response to the meal you break the fast with will be very minor. At first I would break all my fasts with homemade organic bread and olive oil, and this was a really big mistake. While it tasted delicious, my heart would pound and go wild. I was probably lucky I didn't have a heart attack because when I started fasting I was already headed down that road. In time I learned the best thing was very tender roasts, broth, and other low carb but easy to digest foods. Eggs are also a good choice if you can stomach them. I try not to break fast with steaks because they can be a little hard to digest. And I definitely steer clear of any grains including bread and pizza and keep in mind that this Extreme insulin sensitivity also means any garbage that's in your food will be absorbed very strongly so you want to avoid grains in particular because they're full of arsenic and lead. Consumer Reports tested 45 packaged fruit juices for heavy metals. It found measurable levels in every product. More than 80% of parents with children three years old and younger give their kids fruit juices. And this is especially important when you're just starting to fast. These days, breaking a three to four day fast is no big deal to me at all, and I don't feel anything too different from normal. At first though, I would always feel almost worse on the day that I broke the fast than I did on the fast itself. I felt like I needed a day or two just to recover from the fast. It was very odd. The more you fast, the less refeeding syndrome will be a possibility. And in reality, it's only an issue with long fasts in the first place. Especially long fasts broken with a high carb meal, which provokes a large insulin response. Meals low in salt also make this more likely to happen, as both water and electrolytes follow sodium through the body. If you have more sodium in your meal, less water and electrolytes can flood into your cells. This also applies to sodium taken before breaking the fast. So while refeeding syndrome sounds very scary, it's pretty easy to avoid. I prefer 36 to 96 hour fast anyway, but this is one of the reasons why, though the main one is that it's simply not going to slow your metabolism. And these issues just don't occur for these shorter fasts. If I do do a longer fast, which I have once in a while, then I take a little salt during the fast to help keep my electrolytes up. And if I ever did a really, really long one of several weeks, then I would also take some B1 vitamins. I also keep my carbs pretty much zero on the first meal after a fast now, which I learned after long experience is the best way to do it. And I only slowly add back carbs into the diet. If you're bound to determine to do these very long fasts that some people do, then only work up to them very slowly. So there's less fluctuation in electrolytes and also take some B vitamins and some salt every day. If you do all this and only refeed slowly on low carb foods like broth or eggs, then everything should be just fine. Another thing I learned from fasting is how tightly linked binging is to carbohydrates. Due to the hyperinsulinic response after breaking a fast, carbohydrates have even more effect on your appetite when you're having them right after a fast. I found out quickly that having carbs right after a fast was simply a recipe for disaster. I hit Popeye's Del Taco. 14,000 calories later, I found myself down at Subway, powering through a 12 inch veggie on whole wheat, battling to cut out a Jared. Thankfully, I never binge on food normally, but when I eat carbs to break a fast, I found it was almost impossible to stop eating. At first, I would eat so much after a fast that while my blood pressure was going down, I really wasn't losing all that much weight. I always determined to eat less after the fast the next time, but I always had trouble until I realized that breaking the fast with low carbs just didn't have this problem. It is largely insulin and cortisol that drive hunger, and when you eat, insulin goes up and this triggers cortisol in response, which creates blood sugar out of glycerol, and it does this because the insulin drives down the blood sugar after the meal if it's a strong insulin response. 
And when there's not enough glycerol available for cortisol to use, it has to use protein for that purpose. And it mainly likes to use collagen and elastin, which are the most readily available. And this has a very negative effect on your skin. While I came to see how true this was from fasting, it also applies when you're not fasting. In fact, in one experiment, 100% of the participants who were binge eaters who went on a low carb diet in the study completely stopped binge eating in that time. While low carb is always healthier, if you do eat more carbs, it is helpful to eat plenty of fat with those carbs. This will keep insulin from spiking and will dramatically reduce your hunger. Also keep in mind that in humans, saturated fat is extremely satiating and so is protein. So foods like fatty meat are really going to kill your hunger. And sardines and eggs are particularly good at doing this. That's not the case with rodents, which require a diet of 99% fat before they can even start to enter into ketosis. And the ketones are one of the main things that drives down hunger. This is very important to remember when you're analyzing dietary studies. And this is a fact that researchers are almost certain to know. So I suspect that this so-called mistake is actually intentional fraud in many cases. Insulin, carbohydrates, fasting, and electrolytes, they all go hand in hand when it comes to your health. And if you don't understand this while fasting, it can lead to disaster. Increasing fast length slowly, avoiding carbs when breaking a fast, and taking supplemental salt or supplemental vitamin B1 on fasts of a week or more are important to safely fast for very long periods. It's also important to realize it's not necessary to fast for very long periods of a week or more. This will not only increase the chance of a bad reaction, but also increase the risk of slowing your metabolism. That's why I mostly recommend 36 to 96 hour fast. These are shown to be safe for your metabolism and even to increase lean tissue and metabolic rate. Not just in the short term, but also when doing these fasts on an ongoing basis. And that was also my own personal experience. Fasting can be stressful both mentally and physically. But once you know how it works, there's no need to be afraid of it. You may feel weak or even grumpy when you fast at first. And definitely I felt both of those things when I first started it. But if you do it right, your health will be regenerated. And you will feel amazing afterwards. Vince, I suddenly feel much better.